Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this instructional cooking show. Today we took a road trip. We are at 3 in Franklin that's located on West Central Street in Franklin and today my co-host Joe Murphy along with executive chef of 3, Chad Terry, will be cooking this delicious spicy dish called jambalaya. Later on we will have the chef's tip and I will be sitting down with Brian Lavella, the GM of Three, to talk more about this beautiful restaurant. So let's go over to Joe and Chad on location at Three in the function room to cook this amazing dish. Hi, I'm Chef Joe Murphy, co-host of the Chef's Table series, a cooking show dedicated to instruction and education. And I'm pleased to say we're here with Chef Chad Terry of Three Restaurant. Chef, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Uh, we've got a recipe we haven't seen before, and we have a, quite a few ingredients, which is Great, and I want to talk about mise en place. With this particular dish, mise en place is very important. Chef, why don't you show us exactly how many ingredients we have? What I see here is two, four, six, eight, ten. Plus, we have <laughs> over here and two, three, four there. Right. So, how do we start this dish? Well, how do we start the dish? I can show you my ingredients. We have a uh, poblano pepper. Right. We have uh, celery, onion, okra. Um, red bell pepper, long grain rice. If we, um, for my seasoning, we're going to go with um, chili powder, cumin, and Cajun seasoning. Wow. And then when we get going, we're going to use uh, a crushed uh, stewed tomato. Stewed tomato, okay. And now, for the viewing audience that aren't familiar with the different types of peppers, is the poblano a hot pepper or is that a mild pepper? It's, uh, it's medium. More, you're going to get more heat out of the seed right. than the actual yeah. the meat. Right, and that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, if you do not want any heat, leave those seeds, seeds out. You will get some. But that's yeah, you where, get a few in there, but right. that's just... That's the heat comes from the seeds, right. basically, correct? Definitely. Okay, Needles. great. And then uh, once you get started, you'd start in a saucepan. So... There are two segments, really. You're doing your vegetables and your base. Right, my vegetables and my rice. Um, we'll make that, we'll simmer it, we'll set it aside, and then we'll move on to the proteins, and we'll finish the dish. Great, great. But um, one thing I like to do is I like to make the rice base and then have that separate and then add my proteins. So in making this, and a lot of people make it in a large pot, and then you can run into um, overcooking your chicken, drying it out, right. overcooking your sausage. Right. And then shrimp, you don't want the shrimp to be right. all rubbery. Now, rubber. Chef just gave you a great tip. He gets his base pretty much done. Is that correct? And yes. then you do your proteins. Yes. Because if you try to do the proteins the same time at, as your base, what's going to happen is your shrimp, your chicken, your andouille sausage is going to dry out. And you don't want that because that will definitely spoil your dish. Right. All right. Now, what type of oil are you using? Uh, I have a, uh, it's a 90-10 blended oil. It's a uh, canola and extra virgin olive oil. Oh, nice. Blend. Yeah. Yeah, and, and cooking, it depends on what you're cooking, but a lot of professional restaurants will use a blend, a chef is, you know, with a lot of canola oil. And olive oil, as you've heard in the show before, has a very low smoke temperature. So the canola, you can get a much higher heat. I do a lot of cooking myself with just olive oil, but you have to really watch what you're doing. Right. Otherwise, that oil will turn. Yeah, you get a real smoky flavor. Right. And, right. We don't want to spoil the dish. Okay. Why don't we get moving and All right, we'll yeah. see what Just we're doing. Check. Make sure the pan's hot there. Nice, right. nice heat. Yeah. Um, Go we're going to start with the oil. Yeah. I want to say one thing. The chef just gave you another tip. You know, a lot of people are afraid to get that heat pumped up, but Chef just said, told you, get that pan. Well, a nice hot pan right. creates um, 
Caramelization. Caramelization, keep your vegetables from sticking. Right. And again, we'll show you when we do the proteins right. later. So now I have a little bit of smoke coming off here, so yeah. I know and I can see yeah. my oil. It's kind of thinning and turning uh, translucent. Right. So right. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start. Sure. Now, if the chef just points it out, this pan is so hot, you could see a little bit of smoke coming out. But once he starts putting these ingredients in, what will happen is that will also bring down the temperature of that pan, all right? But you do want that, that smoking hot pan. I want to saute the vegetables. I want to get them um, nice and tender in a few minutes. Um, you're going to caramelize it. What that's going to do is release the natural sugars. Right. Yeah. And you're going to get your nice flavors. Yeah. Uh, the oils from the peppers is going to come out, and you're going to get some of that heat that we talked about from yeah. the seed. Okay. Um, yeah, and Chef just gave you a great tip, and we talked about this, I think it was on a previous, recently, on a previous show. One thing about that really smoking hot pan is it's going to release those sugars, the oils, and that's what you want because then you're getting a integration of flavors. So in professional cooking, when you go to a restaurant like Three and you say, gee, that was terrific. I wish I could cook like that. These are some of the techniques that you will find in, in, in some really top restaurants. Now, we're getting some color here on our vegetables. Yep. See some caramelization on the yep. edges there. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to go ahead and add the garlic. I don't want to add the garlic too early. Right. Because if you add the garlic too early, it's going to burn. You're going to get a bitter flavor. Yeah. Um, so I like to add the garlic now. Yeah, and again, Chef just gave you another great tip. Remember, when you put that garlic in, keep your eye on it. If that turns dark brown or black, you might as well throw out what you've <laughs> already done because that dish is going to be so bitter. All right. See as our garlic's turning white from the yellow, so you yep. can see that that's cooking. Yeah. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add my rice, and then we're going to add our broth, and we're going to right. season it. I don't want to add my seasonings right now because I don't want those to burn. Yeah. In I, that pan. I, right. That chef just gave you another great tip. This is a great show for tips. He said that he doesn't want to add his seasonings at this point because he doesn't want them to burn. And again, that would be like a garlic situation. It will ruin the dish. Now, he's, I'm presuming, and I'm going to ask the chef right now, he added his rice without the liquid. You wanted to coat that, is yeah, it? Yeah, I just wanted to coat it, get some flavors in there. Great. Absorb some of the oil. Yeah, excellent. And then I have my liquid, which is a... Um, 50-50 chicken stock, beef okay. stock. Right. Now, you can get stocks in your local supermarkets, and some of them, I would say, are very good. I'm sure you're making your own stock. We do. We roast yeah. our bones, make our own stocks. Um, a lot of the stuff you buy in the store can be actually a little salty. Right. So then you have to watch that when you're cooking at home. You don't yeah. wanna, you'll be wondering why you're uh, yeah. all I always look for the... Uh, if I'm buying any pre-made stocks, I'll look for the sodium free because you really want to do your own seasoning. And Chef and I were talking about the butter that's used in a commercial situation isn't unsalted. You want to do your own seasoning. Yeah, that allows you to control your salt content. Right. So yeah, once we get the there. rice in here, uh, you know, you do your usual method of covering that pan, right? And let it simmer. Yes. And how about, long does about it half take? About half an hour, forty minutes. I mean, a small batch like this isn't going right. to take that long. But this, but. and I, I'm going to ask chefs. You know, this is his recipe. This is something you could probably make three or four days before if you wanted to serve it. To yeah, I wouldn't go there. I mean. Maybe two or three days, yeah. Okay. And again, and that's where you make the base. That's what I'm talking about. And then you would introduce about. your proteins later. Right, yeah. In other words, that's what I was getting to okay. the point. If you made your base, you know, refrigerated, seal it with a nice plastic wrap, or if you have a, a sealing container with a lid, fine. And then when you want to serve it, you take it out, you can reheat it quickly, microwave, which I don't like microwave. I would microwave it. But you uh, just stock in a nice saute pan. That's what I like myself. And uh, I always figure on a pre cooked food, 
when you throw it into your microwave, it's going to destroy whatever oh. is left. And dry it out. It's yeah. Gonna burn it. It's going to right. be horrible. Right. But you do want, you know, as Chef pointed out, early on your proteins, you don't want to cook those when you're doing your base, okay? You want to wait until that base is pretty much done because they're going to dry out. And again... I mean, you, I'm not saying you definitely shouldn't do it. I mean, my personal, just from hand on in, if I'm going to have people over, I don't want to have a big pot sitting on the, on the back stove at my yeah. house or, you right. know, again at the restaurant. Right. You know, I could be cooking to order the proteins and not have right. them dry out. Yeah, which but, is great to hear. It's particularly in a restaurant you know he's cooking to water some things every restaurant will have your base things pre-cooked but when your proteins he's cooking to order which is a great feature with this restaurant and you will find that pretty much in all your better restaurants so all right okay so we now let this to simmer off to the side for about you know like we said half hour 40 minutes okay and great. then um once that is done right. we'll be able to move on to putting the dish together. Okay, great. Yeah, you, and is that your okra that you have left? You Would you do put uh, a portion in there? Yeah, I just actually wanted to hold off. I, um, I'm going to put it in at the end over there. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I just swear this is a, um, it's already a blanched item. Yeah. Um, I don't want it to break down and become mushy. Okay, fine. I just, um. Yeah, one thing I, I definitely want to talk to is, you know, the foundation that produces this show and these restaurants that allow us to come into their, uh, their space and use their time are really supporting our ability to talk about homeless people in the state of Massachusetts. And our focus as a foundation, we've started off taking a look at homeless young adults, and we're talking 18 years and younger. And in that in that category, there's a staggering number in the state of Massachusetts. There are 6,000 18-year-olders or younger that are considered homeless in the state. And because of their situation, they have multiple problems, obviously, that they deal with. So as our show moves forward and we're able to have supporters support the foundation, and create this awareness, we hope to help these young adults that may have a passion to go to a culinary school, and we want to be able to help them help themselves come out of the poverty and homeless category, as well as we're thinking about if, if a young person has an interest in shooting video or you know we're going to start thinking about maybe we could support some young people high school age that may want to continue their education in filmmaking. Uh, I gotta tell you, it, it, it's mind-boggling. I've read some studies, we recently talked last week actually, to a very large homeless shelter and it's named the Franciscan House, it's in Boston, and homeless people, believe it or not, there's a terrible obesity rate because of the foods that they eat. So now there's a mandate to these institutions that are supporting the homeless. They need fresh vegetables. They need to change their menus, fresh vegetables and fruits. So there's another segment that we've been asked to take a look at supporting. So you're going to be seeing somewhere in the very near future short segments of different facilities around the state that are helping people in need. And that's what we're about, you know, service before self. So, uh, I'm sorry about that interruption, uh, but it gave me a few minutes while this is cooking to talk about the foundation. And uh, <coughs> Chef, well, you know, hopefully we're getting close to that point where, you know, this is being done. Now, can we take oh, yeah. a look at that? Now, obviously that lid is hot. Right. And I used to have Teflon hands, but they go Teflon gone hands? Now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, again, it's just simmering. Yeah. Okay, that's great. But I've got to tell you, with, with these, the spices he's using and the, the aromas are really starting to build, which is great. And when he used that hot pan and threw those peppers in and the onions, 
that brought out those oils and sugars. So you're really getting a great aroma. All right, now, Chef, your Hang cuisine here, uh, you know, this is a Cajun, is that correct? Cajun, yes. Yeah, okay. Louisiana great. style. Right, Louisiana <clears throat> style. Uh, one thing Chef was talking about, you know, some time ago, he was taking a look at, you know, andouille. Where, where does the andouille sausage come from? <laughs> and, and it comes from a German Louisiana. So see, yeah, German immigrants. Right. Now in Louisiana um, back in the day. So, but, but it is considered French. French, okay, so, yeah. However that works out. Well, I'm guessing the French <laughs> Alps and the German Alps, you know, they saw it. They do touch, I think, in Europe, and there is an area, I can't think of the name of it now, where they speak French and German in this village or town or city. So, anyways, that's great. Why don't we show uh, the proteins? What do we have for proteins here? Proteins, I have a, um, a shrimp, nice fresh shrimp, um, chicken tenderloin that's chopped up small. Okay. Um, then I have tasso. What is tasso? Tasso is a uh, smoked ham. Nice. And then I have andouille sausage. Okay. And I have all the pieces cut small, so everything's, you know. Bite really, size. Yeah, you don't, need the, um, you don't need a knife when you're going to be eating this dish. Yeah. And uh, that's why we chose this shrimp. It's a nice small shrimp. Usually they use crayfish, and it's just the tail, and it's all, you know. Right, to put right. that, you know, on our menu up, up this way, and, uh, you know, it just works yeah. for us. Well, what, I did want to ask you a question on your shrimp. You take the tail, oh, that's the chicken, sorry. You leave the tails on? No, tails are off. Tails Peeled, are off. Deveined. Okay, so. All ready to go. Okay, great. So you don't have to pick at it yeah. when you're, just like I said, just with a fork. Right. So if um, I can start this right up. Great. Again, we're gonna start with a hot pan. Yeah. Nice flame. Excellent. I'm gonna let that heat up. Yeah. Now, I notice you have some flour here. Yep. Okay. They've, uh, the flour is for dredging the, the chicken. Okay, great. And I like to do that. That's going to do a few things for us. Sure. It's going to add uh, flavor as, yeah. a, as a caramelize and, and yeah. turns a little uh, light brown. Right. Add some uh, nuttiness to it yeah. as it turns. Uh, it's also going to keep the chicken, it's providing to have a nice hot pan, hot oil. Yeah. Um, it's going to help keep it from sticking to my pan. Right. Well, I, I'm hoping our viewing audience has watched me enough to know that I am not nutty. Even though the crew <laughs> thinks I'm nutty, we use ingredients like flour. That was supposed to be a joke, folks. A joke. Uh, yeah, to, to get a little bit. It's all about depth and building flavors. Definitely. Every recipe, it's a building process, yeah. OK? Thanks. If you just put everything in the pan and just try and cook it, you're not going to bring the flavors out properly. Right. Yeah. Like when I get into sauteing this, I mean, yeah, these are these are cooked items already, but you want to release the oils just like in the vegetables, but these oils are more important. You're going to really get some good flavor. You're going to intensify that heat. Yeah. So, yeah, be nice. Chef just gave you another great tip. You know, that pan's got to be hot. You want to bring out those flavors. You want to build. It's like building a wall. You know, it just every ingredient and you may want to learn to season in between you know these are all techniques that you'll right. see so right, like this was heavily seasoned like you know with the cumin the chili the cajun yeah. again with salt right and pepper um again and we'll adjust this at the end too right and okay. you will know, we'll most likely salt it again i mean rice yeah. ripe rice absorbs a lot of uh, salt and flavor so right and it continuously Quick question, Adding. would you consider this a mild heat? I'm talking I, not temperature heat, spice heat. Spicy, I'm going to say mild. Okay. I mean, yeah. I have a lot of friends and stuff that eat stuff that is like really off the charts and, yeah. you know, this is considered uh, pretty mild. Yeah, and that's where I draw the so, line. I prefer a mild spice heat myself. All right. So I guess I'm going to dredge, dredge the chicken, coat it. You know, and another another tip, and we, we didn't talk about this, but if you notice, Chef had his proteins separate. You do not want cross-contamination with, for instance, putting your raw chicken and your raw shrimp in the same container. And that's something to keep in mind. Now, Chef is doing his chicken first, okay? Yeah, we do the chicken first. It takes the longest. So, 
you just we're gonna do that and then I'm gonna go with the shrimp after right and get that going and yeah. then, like I said these two items are cooked already so okay uh, yeah and when you're cooking you know just keep that in mind as you're building that wall you want to start with the item that takes the longer and you don't have to be uh, signature chef you know, we all know, for instance, you get a pepper, that's going to take, or a carrot, that's going to take right. longer, for instance, than garlic, okay? And so just try to think that through. And your cooking experience becomes far more enjoyable. And get some of the browning I talked oh, about. Yeah. I can that's see that. Some of the nuttiness. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> Hey, you want to take over? Go right there. No, 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 no. no I yeah. What I wanted to do is just tilt it so the people can see what that brown looks like if we could tilt it that way a little right. bit. You can see, and that's what we call caramelization. And that caramelization is really going to add flavor to your final oh, yeah. dish. All right. We're about halfway there with our chicken. Okay, great. I'm gonna go with the shrimp right now. Yeah. The aromas are incredible. On a previous show, we had uh, a chef on, and you know, I was commenting on the aromas, and he commented about smell of vision and. It, it would be great if we did. It would really add to the experience. But you know what? We want you to take the time to make this dish. So when you do that, you're going to get that sense of and the sensation of all these flavors coming together. I should tell you at this point also, you can re-watch this show and also get the recipe off of the website and a link to the show is on the website and the name of the website is the chef table series dot tv so you can certainly watch it there's information there about the foundation and you know we'd love to hear from you so please you know let us know what you think and if you have a restaurant that you would like us to bring on Please, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. So what did you just add there? I now? just added the uh, andouille sausage oh, and then the uh, tasso. Oh, that's good. So now you can start to, you can smell that now. Oh, yeah. It starts to change. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That right. sausage almost smells like tabasa. Tabasa, right? Yeah. All right, so everything's just about cooked. I'm going to add my rice. Chef, can I ask you a question? Yes. Now, do you have to deglaze the pan at all, or do you do that with this? Pan? I will. I'm actually going to deglaze it right now with my um, chicken chicken and beef broth. Oh, sweet. All right. Okay, great. And then um, at this point, we're going to be adding our rice base that we had made earlier. Excellent. So there we go. We deglaze a little bit there. Yeah. It's going to release some of the, um, the flavor off the pan there. Excellent, yeah. So, and that's another great tip Jeff just gave you. He used his stock, his stock blend, the beef and chicken stock that they make in house, and he deglazed the pan with it because the protein was cooked. So, you know, there was browning on the bottom of the pan, and this will add more flavor. So, in order to keep a, a, within a time window, Chef made earlier the base with the rice. I have my rice. And so we're going to finish plate, getting this ready for plating, right? All right. Yes, and obviously this would have cooked out, cooked through. Right. Um, and prepared this and set this aside. Okay. And so now. So on a reheat, just throw it in a saute. You, you have your glazing liquid and your proteins are good and hot. This right. rice, and again, if you recall, a few minutes ago we talked about making this if you want two or three days before. yeah I don't and I didn't like the idea of miking and chef said no saute and I agree that's how I reheat with the saute 
So, Chef, are you adding a little more liquid? A little more liquid. It was dry. The rice. Out a yeah, the, bit. the rice will yep. need a little more liquid to come back. Oh, I see, I see come back. Absolutely Which... smells fantastic. And I got to tell you, if you want to have company, I would not be embarrassed to invite people to dinner because you have like chicken, you have your shrimp, you have you have some. Oh, you uh, have a little bit of everything. It's, yeah. kind of, it's a fun dish. I mean, you have your you have your seafood. You can I I had seafood. We have chicken. I mean, right. you have your sausage, and you know people like the heat. Right. So it's pretty good. Yeah. And rice. One other thing too, for presentation, okay. The colors you have: the red, you have the green peppers, you have the pink shrimp. The uh, the browned chicken. It, it's just it's a great look from you know for eye appeal. I just simmer that a little bit. Yeah, and I notice also here that there is some thickening going on here with the uh, with your stock. So is that coming from the flour that from was the on flour the in the bottom of the pan? Yeah, it's kind of it created almost like a little bit of a roux. Yeah, had the stock, so now that's thickening a little bit. Right, um, and then a little bit of the rice, yeah. and then the uh, starch is released. I've got to tell you, this dish looks also, fantastic. So if you and the okra, right? You can see, it's it, a little starchy. Oh yeah. Okay. So if you do not want, for instance, if you don't eat meat, you could do this with. The shrimp, the scallops, probably. You oh, won't yeah. get the the nice flavors. Oh, you can certainly opinion. make any any rice dish, anything like that. Yeah, but you could use all the ingredients, but just switch to seafood. Or if you were wouldn't eat seafood, you know, you could put your beans or whatever you like in there if you're a pure vegetarian. So, all right. So at this point, we're yeah. uh, kind of we're done. We have our, our flavors are all together here. Great. Um, it's kind of a bit bigger portion than I wanted, but yes. you'll enjoy that though. Oh, absolutely. We can't wait to taste <laughs> this dish. All right, get all our shrimp in there. We're good. Excellent. Good to go. Okay, very good. That is a beautiful dish. And I got to tell you again, please. Go to the Chef's Table Series TV website, get the menu. The chef was good enough to provide the menu, and you can also rewatch the show. My recommendation has been if you have a laptop, pull it, the show up on the website on your laptop, have that recipe, and you can cook your uh, jambalaya along with the chef and just follow him and follow the recipe and it will really add to your cooking enjoyment and you could do it as a family thing you could do it as a girls night out thing you know it's great to have chef chat here so it would be like having your own personal chef yeah right okay yeah, no i submitted a, uh, a detailed recipe and all step by step should be okay. easy to follow great and all the ingredients as far as at the store excellent well, thank you, Chef. All we right, well, really you. appreciate you coming and participating on this show. And we'd like to thank Three Restaurant in Franklin, Mass. And it's an absolutely beautiful facility. And we want you to remember this show is all about you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. Hi everyone, I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table series. And today we are doing the wine pairing for three restaurants, Jambalaya. And today with me is wine manager of Blanchard's Wines and Spirits, John Paul Kiminga. And he chose a pink reddish wine. Yeah. How come? Tell me um, why you chose this wine. A couple reasons. Mm -hmm. um, dry rosés tend to go with a lot of things. One of the reasons I chose this particular rosé um, which is made from Cabernet Franc grapes, is because oh. uh, the jambalaya had a lot of assertive vegetables in it, like poblano peppers and okra. That's right. Yeah. And chinon um, is made from Cabernet Franc grapes, um, yeah. if it's red or rosé. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cabernet Franc often mm -hmm. has these sort of vegetal, um, herbal notes to it. And mm -hmm. I, you know, this is quite subtle here. It's not overly vegetal or green. Right. Um, but there are those subtle notes um, there, and I thought that might, might interplay nicely with the dish. Oh, and even if that thinking. didn't work, it's just a nice, dry, crisp rosé. It should mm -hmm. simply act as a refreshing beverage for the dish. So, 
Uh, should we give it a try? Let's try it, yes. All right, let's do it. Oh, this is light. Yeah, it's a very subtle color. Yes, it is very um, subtle. You know, it's almost a little orange, kind yeah. of. It's not super pink or super red. Now, how come uh, you put the white against the glass? Well, like, should most people do that, or? Well, this is just me trying to be particular and really look at the color at, mm -hmm. against a neutral background, as opposed to this table. Right, this table would not green, work. So, <laughs> um, and do you think people, before they have a glass of wine in general, hmm. so let's say I go to a restaurant yep. and I order a jambalaya and I ask them for a rosé, yep. should they swirl, um, do you think? Or is this more well, for like that, a tasting? I mean, that, that will volatilize the aroma, so kind of push the aromas up in the air. Um, you know, the molecules, these kind of delicate molecules, oh, they float around. So when you do that, it swirls them around and kind yeah. of brings them up in the air. But when you first pour it, you probably shouldn't. I'm always in the habit of swirling it right away. But when yeah. you first pour it, you might not want to swirl it. Just bring it up and give it a sniff first. Oh. There might be some very delicate aromas that disappear the moment you swirl it. Oh, I see. Okay, let's taste. Oh, that's Delicious. nice. Yes. Yeah. Very crisp, very dry. Right. It's you very almost, light, though, because yeah. that which will, like I always say, it doesn't overpower. Yeah. Because the jambalaya is a lot of overpowering. Yeah, there's a lot meats of meats and vegetables, mm -hmm. and it is a, also has some spices in there. So yeah. this will go down very nicely. I think. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. That's the. That's what I was hoping for. Yeah, I think it's um, this is enjoyable even without having it just having it with some friends. Yeah, rosé is great in the summer. Make sure you chill it. Mm. I don't know. It's yeah. the best way to enjoy it anyways. Yeah. So do you think most rosés should be cold? Yeah, in general. Yeah. Um, probably at least as cold as a lot of whites would mm -hmm. be. Um, many, um, many whites, if they were going to be less than you know, cold, right. uh, would be when they're really full-bodied, really maybe oaky or heavy. Mm -hmm. And most rosés are not going to be full-bodied Right, so you, really, heavy, you want so them nice and cold. You generally want them pretty crisp. Perfect. Um, you can always start off cold, and it's a lot easier to warm it up like this than oh, that's right. trying to chill it yeah. you know, after the fact. So right. better to start a little too cold. Right. John Paul, those were great tips. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. I love learning new things about food and wine and sipping and enjoying. Yeah. So perfect. Well, yeah. That's fun. I feel lucky. That's <laughs> <laughs> what you get to do all day. So tell me how to pronounce this again. Chinon. Chinon. And Chinon is the name of the town and it's in the Loire Valley, um, uh -huh. which is in uh, in north, northern France. Excellent. And uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Oh, so perfect. I'm glad we got to enjoy it. Excellent, excellent. So everyone, that's um, this has been a great wine pairing with three restaurants dish, the jambalaya. And this has been the wine pairing of the week. I'm Carol O'Connor. And I'm John Paul with Blanchard's Wines and Spirits. Um, it's been great to be here on behalf of the Chef's Table Foundation. Perfect, thank you. So everyone, we'll see you next week with the wine pairing of the week. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's tip, farm to table tip. I'm here with Steve Beryl of Beryl Farm. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table series. So Steve, what are we looking at here with all the hay? What's underneath it? Well, we mulched all these beds of garlic we just planted. The garlic is underneath the hay? It's under the hay. Oh, interesting. And uh, we do the same thing with strawberries for somewhat different reasons, but okay. the straw serves as protection for both crops. Oh. In the case of garlic, uh, you take a whole uh, head of garlic yep. and break up and you plant each clove separately. And uh, it's that's another biennial crop. Okay. And the idea, you plant it in the fall and it's good if it gets some root growth, mm -hmm. but if it gets much top growth, uh, it'll think next spring is its second season. We don't want it to think that. We right. want it to think we've just been helping it wake up and mm -hmm. it can really take mm -hmm. off in the spring. So the purpose of the straw here is to keep the soil cool yes. on a sunny day in the fall. Uh, here, this is uh, the 10th of November, mm -hmm. <coughs> and we planted this about uh, two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, that, that's one of the tricky things. Cause I, grown it a few times before without mulch and when these seasons change so much uh, sometimes October can be very warm and right. sometimes very cool and if it gets too much growth like 
you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But let's see if we can see what it's doing here now, if I can oh, find okay. some. Might or might not right away. Yeah, we found oh. No, we didn't. Nope. We're searching for the garlic underneath the straw. Oh, yeah, oh, oh there it is. Oh. It was down a little deeper than yeah. I thought. Yep. And you can see, in two weeks, maybe you can see, it's got some nice roots coming out. Mm -hmm. and there's no, the top growth is just a tiny sprout, nothing really. And uh, I think we're going to be in good shape here because mm -hmm. we have the mulch on to keep the surface cool. Right. And it's rooting very nicely now. Oh, so good. that's just exactly what we want. Now, when will these be picked? Oh, this will be picked uh, mid to late summer next year. So well, it has to grow. And, they got a long way to go. Yeah, each clove will kind of disintegrate and yes. start a whole new bulb with 10 or 12 cloves oh. on it. And that's how it works. Oh, I love it. Garlic is so good. Yeah. It's really good for you. I mean, yeah, it's heavy on the breath, but it's very tasty though. <laughs> Here we can get it back oh, in there again. Yeah. Make it all Cover it all up. up. <laughs> oh, Steve. Thank you. So everyone, this has been the Founder Table Tip on Garlic. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table series, and with Steve Verrill of Verrill Farm. So we'll see you next week. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's craft beer pairing. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table series. This is Kelsey Roth of Craft Beer Cellar. I gave him the homework to find a beer that would pair well with executive chef Chad Terry of Three Restaurant. He made this delicious, full of stuff jambalaya. So what did you <laughs> choose to make to go as well as with all those ingredients? Well, when I think of jambalaya, I think <laughs> spice. Yes. Yeah, uh, definitely a good jambalaya is going to be spicy. It's going to have some heat to it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of different flavors going on. So you want something that can A, stand up to that, but also is going to kind of help temper it a little bit. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that you could cre cre create a good balance between the beverage and the food. Right. Um, so I went with, uh, this is a new product from Notch Brewing. Um, they're located up in Salem, Massachusetts. That's right, yeah. And this is their black lager. He does traditionally Czech style beers. And this one uh, in the Czech Republic is called a Chernay Pivo, uh, mm -hmm. which stands for black black beer, basically. Um, oh. And so this is kind of a Czech style black lager. And uh, the place that made this famous is a bar in Prague called Ufleku that's been brewing and in operation since 1499. Wow. Um, but, that's uh, long. <laughs> yeah, this, so this beer, um, because it's a lager, it's fairly light in body. This is only. 4% alcohol mm -hmm. too, so it's fairly low in alcohol as well, but it's not suffering Ooh. from any flavor. It's dark as like a root beer or a Coca-Cola. Yeah, or wow. even, you know, like a, like a, like a stout or Yes, a or Guinness or something. Or something yeah, right? exactly. Dark. And mm, smells light. Yeah, it's a, it's got a nice, ni nice light aroma. You get a little bit of roast in there, so um, a little bit of like mm -hmm. uh, coffee, roast coffee, a little bit of uh, maybe dark chocolate, bitter dark chocolate. Um, and wow. uh, so there's two things that can really enhance spice um, to sometimes make it un unpleasant. And <laughs> hops in beer yep. actually make spice hotter as well as alcohol. So you want something uh, that's going to be relatively low in alcohol but also not have a lot of hop character so to it. Less in alcohol, less in hops. Right. Perfect. Yeah. So if you're somebody who loves heat, then you go for the double IPAs. <laughs> <and> <laughs> um, but this is something that I think would just go fantastic. Plus jambalaya has got a nice uh, kind of earthy note to it anyway, um, you know, from all the different spices and herbs yeah. and the saffron. Um, yeah. This is just going to pair beautifully with that. Oh, nice. Oh, that tastes nice. Yeah, so like and this. it's light. 
It um, is light. I mean, I, I'm thinking it's going to be heavy, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's it's light. Yeah. I like it. And this is uh, mm. this actually has I mean, this has less alcohol in, in it than Guinness. Um, <laughs> but yeah, people often see a dark beer like this and they're like, oh, it's going to be heavy. I'm right. not going to like it. But heavy. this is super light, super drinkable. Mm -hmm. It's dry, so um, so it doesn't. Uh, you know, it's not cloying or sweet or anything like that, and it's just going to go so well with that jumbo. Exactly, and like, and I like to say, it can definitely be drunk on its own. Yeah, you know, it's just very <laughs> drunk on its own. That's, that's a cute little joke. Yeah, yep. this is very good. But yeah, it's a it's, <laughs> it's a really good beer, just yeah. all all by itself. I love it, and it's and it's new of, of this year. Yep. Wow. Um, well, he he had done it several versions before, but this is the first time he's done it in in the can and in this mm -hmm. version. Oh, I love um, it. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we're we're big fans of everything Notch does, and mm -hmm. plus they're a great local brewery as yeah, well. Yeah, we've had yeah, I've tried their beers before. It's, they're excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great that they're in Massachusetts too, mm -hmm. nice and local. So thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. Perfect. So everyone, this has been the craft beer pairing for Chad Cherry's Jambalaya. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host the Chef's Table series. And I'm Kelsey Roth with Craft Beer Cellar. We're a proud supporter of the Chef's Table Foundation. Hi folks, Steve LeCown, chef owner of KR Bistro in Westwood with this week's chef's tip. Uh, this week I just want to talk about something simple but something we use a lot of, uh, just finely mincing garlic and how to do it in a more efficient way and how to get it really fine. Now I know they sell that finely minced garlic in the jars which might have been done seven months ago. I mean the stuff is awful in my opinion. I, I would never use that product. Um, but anyway, you want to take this little bitter end off the garlic first. If you see any green shoots, those should come out as well. That's generally a sign that that garlic's a little bit old. Uh, so that's plenty there. We'll start with that. But what I'm going to do, just start slicing it a little bit. And ra random cuts are fine here. You don't, you don't have to worry about being perfectly neat. And I'm going to use a very good friend here to help me out, and it's called salt. And there's a couple of reasons I'm using this. Because I want this finely minced, uh, if you notice, even when I was slicing the garlic, it can tend to stick to the blade. Well, using the salt like this, and you're probably going to use salt in the recipe anyway, so you can just use a little bit less of it. But using the salt acts as an abrasive, which keeps the garlic slices from sticking to each other. More importantly, it keeps them from riding up the blade of the knife. Okay, or if they're there, they just wipe right off. So I'll get that finely chopped by hand for most part. Another, another technique you can use is the, the quick rocking technique. You pin the front of your knife down and just pick this up and kind of move it. If you find that the garlic's sticking a little bit, just salt it again. And then when I want to get it even finer, almost into a paste, I'm going, to, I'm going to use a substantial amount of salt here this time. And now I'm going to use it as abrasive. And I'm going to take my knife, okay, press down pretty firmly here in small increments. And I'm crushing the garlic and then I'm pulling it. While I'm pulling it, I'm twisting that knife in an upward motion. Okay, so this, this is not difficult. And then once you get to know what you're doing, you can do it at a more rapid pace. And just a couple passes like that. I'm really, I'm really pushing on this blade while I'm doing that. You can see it's getting very wet. I'm really crushing this garlic. It's, it's getting moist now. The juices are coming out of it. So I'm going to put a little bit more salt. And my last pass at this, I'm ending up with a, actually a garlic paste here which has many uses. I know this is not the most intricate tip that I'm going to ever give you, but it's one of the most useful. We do use garlic for a lot of items. I would take something like this. That's what I would probably rub with some olive oil on to make garlic bread. Uh, I would, 
if I were roasting a whole chicken, I might take that garlic paste and just rub all the chicken skin before I roast the whole chicken along with fresh rosemary, maybe a little lemon zest or something like that. One important factor to keep in mind, uh, you might want to measure how much salt you're using. If I'm going to use all this garlic in a recipe that called for three teaspoons of salt, I may have just used a whole teaspoon in this garlic. Now if I'm using all of that, keep that as a factor, um, minus one teaspoon from your recipe. So just kind of be conscious of how much you're using. Um, my wife loves when I come home, my fingers smell like garlic. So another little tip on how to get rid of the smell of garlic, and it actually works wonderfully with salmon too, if you have that smell on your fingers, is to wash your hands with celery salt. There is some kind of enzyme or something that's in celery that does take away odors, and it does a pretty good job. So thanks, thanks for watching, and it's Steve LeCount, Chiara Bistro in Westwood with this week's Chef's Tip. Hi, I'm Marjorie Gann, and I work at Ethos in Jamaica Plain, and we're an organization that serves elders and people of all ages with disabilities. We're also the nutrition provider for Southwest Boston, so we serve Meals on Wheels, community cafes, and provide in-home nutrition consultation. I've been a registered dietitian, wife and mom for over 30 years, so I've developed some pretty good nutrition tips to help that are practical and easy to do. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about sodium. Sodium is half of salt, which is actually sodium chloride, and it's estimated that in the United States, people eat about, say, give or take, 2,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Now the Institute of Medicine says it should only be 1,500. And for people who eat a lot of salt, which probably would be males around 30, you're actually talking as much as, say, 4,000 milligrams. So here's a little quiz. Here are three foods, and they have different amounts of sodium. Which food on this table is the saltiest? Is it the hamburger bun, my little chocolate cupcake, or the ounce of potato chips. And I will bet that 80% of you will say it's the potato chips. But being sneaky, these are actually the lowest sodium food on this table. This is an ounce of potato chips. These happen to be a reduced fat potato chip which have less salt on them. So these come in at 85 milligrams for this size serving. The cupcake, and this is a pretty little cupcake if you look at it, 135 milligrams, and you'd probably eat both of the ones that came in the package. And the hamburger bun is the surprise because that's got 220 milligrams of sodium. So if you add into this the hamburger, the french fries, and probably maybe four tablespoons of ketchup, we're really looking at 1,000 milligrams in this one meal versus the Institute of Medicine's recommendation of 1,500 milligrams for the entire day. So you can see why those 30-year-old men are getting their excess sodium. So the easiest way is to cut down on sodium, probably eat fewer processed foods, lots more fresh fruits and vegetables. And that's my tip for the day. I'm Marjorie Gann, and I'm here for Chef's Table. Thank you for joining me. Have your base, get things pre-cooked, but when your proteins, he's cooking tomato, which is a great feature with this restaurant. And you will find that pretty much in all your better restaurants. So, all right. Okay. So we would now let this to simmer off the side. Said half hour, 40 minutes. Okay, and great. Then, um, once that is done, right. we have to move on to putting the dish together. Okay, great. And is that your okra that you have left? You would you do put the uh, portion? In there? Yeah, I just actually want to hold off. I um, want to put it in at the end over there. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> I just wait. This is a um, it's already a blanched item. Yeah. Um, I don't want it to break down and become mushy. Okay, fine. I just um. Yeah, one thing I, I definitely want to talk to is, you know, the foundation that produces... Crack the appearing notch with jambalaya. Chad Terry is executive chef of Three Restaurant. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Craft Beer Pairing. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table Series. This is Kelsey Roth of Craft Beer Cellar. I gave him the homework to find a beer that would pair well with executive chef Chad Terry of Three Restaurant. He made this delicious, full of stuff jambalaya. So what did you choose to make to go as well with all those ingredients?
ingredients. Well, when I think of jambalaya, I think spice. Yes. Yeah, uh, definitely a good jambalaya. It's going to be spicy. It's going to have some heat to it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of different flavors going on. So you want something that can A, stand up to that, but also is going to kind of help temper it a little bit. Um, so. Uh, so that you can create a good balance between the beverage and the food. Right. Um, so I went with, uh, this is a new product from Notch Brewing. Uh, it's one of the most useful. We do use garlic for a lot of items. I would take something like this, that's what I would probably rub with some olive oil and make garlic bread. Uh, I would, if I were roasting a whole chicken, I might take that garlic paste and just rub all the chicken skin before I roast a whole chicken along with fresh rosemary, maybe a little lemon zest or something like that. One important fact to keep in mind, uh, you might want to measure how much salt you're using. If I'm going to use all this garlic in a recipe that calls for three teaspoons of salt, I may have just used a whole teaspoon in this garlic. And if I'm using all of that, keep that as a factor, uh, minus one teaspoon from the recipe. So just kind of be conscious of how much you're using. Um, my wife loves when I come home, my fingers smell like garlic. So another little tip on how to get rid of the smell of garlic and it actually works wonderfully with salmon too if you have that smell on your fingers is to wash your hands with celery salt. There is some kind of enzyme or something that's in celery that does take away odors and it does a pretty good job. So thanks thanks for watching and Steve LeCount, Kiara Bistro in Westwood with this week's Chef's Tip.